Welcome to our second video on simple linear regression. In this video we will discuss how do we construct and interpret confidence intervals for the coefficients. We're going to start this video by recalling the two main objectives of regressions. The objectives of regressions, and for example linear regressions, are two. One was to establish a relationship between two variables, and in particular establish if there's a statistically significant relationship, and the second objective is to forecast new observations. Today we're going to be focusing on the first objective, and very specifically on that issue around having a statistically significant relationship. Let's recap our previous example. We were regressing consumption on income, which means we were trying to explain different levels of consumption by families based on their weekly income. Our coefficients were a 49.13 for the intercept and 0.85 for the slope. This implied that for every dollar we increased in income, we would increment consumption by 0 0.85, or 85 cents. Now, it begs the question, is consumption really related to income? Are we sure that these variables are strongly related such that we can make a claim that income is driving consumption? And in particular, let's recall we're working with a sample of 40 families. Does it make sense that we use an estimate based on just 40 families for the relationship between income and consumption of the entire population? This is what we were going to be discussing today. Let's recall how did we interpret the coefficients. And remember that if this was our model, this meant that for every $100 in income, we had $85 more of consumption. But hold a second. We must recall, once again, that we were working with a sample that was drawn for a much larger population. When we are working with samples, that means we're not observing the entire population. We're making some assumptions on the rest of the population we do not see, and this induces uncertainty. To better clarify the role of this uncertainty, we're going to now show you an example using Excel to simulate sampling. In this example, we will be drawing random samples from a population of families and see how our estimate varies, in particular how it compares to the actual value based on the entire population. Alright, so we're now working in Excel in a file that is available to you on the course website. On the left side of the screen you see a data set for 60,000 families for which we have two data points, income and consumption. So worth noting, this is a very rare and actually hypothetical case in which we observe the entire population. We usually never see the entire population because it is very expensive to collect this data and it takes a lot of time. In most cases, if we wait until we have the entire population in our data set, our data is going to become obsolete and useless. This is why census are ran every 5 to 10 years. Usually what we do on a yearly basis is to take samples and use insight from these samples to make inferences of the entire population. So in this case we have 60,000 observations. And let me just go way below. There are 60,000 observations down here. So we have this. And based on this information, we computed our model. We ran the regression using the entire population. And we see that the intercept is 28, while the coefficient for income is 0.75. What does this tell us? Well, in reality, on average across this entire population, for every $100 more of income, a family's consumption is going to grow by $75. Remember that in our prior models we've always said that it's 85, but now we find that the real value is 75. Now how come that our estimates had a different number compared to this real value? Well, this is due to sampling. What I'm showing you now on the right-hand side is a randomly selected sample of 40 observations out of those 60,000. We observe the exact same data points, only that we only observe it for 40 families, not for the entire 60,000. In between, what I'm showing you is the estimated coefficients of the regression only using the random sample of 40 families. And note that even though they are quite similar to the real values, they are not the same. The real intercept was 28, and we estimated an intercept of 26.55. Meanwhile, the real coefficient for income is 0.75, and we found a 0.76. 
But what would happen if we chose a different random sample? On the right hand side, I now have 40 different observations from the ones I had before. And note that the coefficients change for my estimates. Now my intercept is 17.08 and my coefficient for income is 0.82. Very different from the one we had before. But what if I had taken a different random sample? Now we actually nailed income's coefficient 0.75 and our intercept is closer. But if I took another one, I go farther apart. I'm above the estimated coefficient for the slope. Overall, I'm not really sure what the real value is. In this case, we have a 0.72, which was below the true value, 0 0.80, 0 0.67, farther below. It is very random, and we could continue throwing random samples at it, and we're going to continue obtaining different numbers. Let's check how this looks graphically. In this plot, the red line represents the real relationship based on the entire population. That red line has an intercept of 28 and a slope of 0.75. The blue dots you observe there are the 40 observations in our random sample. And the green line is the line we get from estimating the real model based only on the 40 observations. And you can see it, it is slightly tilted upwards relative to the red line, the real line, which means it has a higher slope. And indeed we have a 0.80, which is higher than the 0.75. But if we took a different sample, we could find a slope that is slower. In this case, you can see that the slope estimated is slower than that of the real values. And in fact, we have an estimated coefficient of 0.70 rather than the 0.75. And we could continue doing this all day long. And both the intercept and the slope are going to be changing. Why? Because we're basing our estimate on 40 different data points that all come from the same population, but they are all samples from this population. Now let's go back to the theory. So what did we learn from the example? Well, we learned that our estimates, even though in general they kind of look similar to the real values, they're not necessarily the true ones. And in fact, it's almost certain they are not the true ones. We know that the real values should be somewhere around a particular set of values. And what we want to do is take our point estimate and then construct a range of values around our point estimate. We're going to call this range of values the confidence interval. In statistics, it is very standard to work with 95% confidence intervals, which means that we're going to establish a range of values where we are 95% certain that the true value lies within it. In order to better comprehend this, it is useful to make a quick recap on how we use the normal distribution. When working with linear regressions, we're always making assumptions about the data and the estimates being normally distributed. And in this case, I'm showing you a histogram of a standard distribution with mean zero and standard deviation equal to one. In a normal standard distribution, if we take 1.96 standard deviations above the mean, and 1.96 standard deviations below the mean. We know that it's very unlikely that we find values outside of this range. In particular, we could find that only 5% of the observations are more than 1.96 standard deviations away from the mean, which means that within these boundaries, we can find approximately 95% of the observations. So what we're going to do to compute our confidence intervals is that we're going to round up these numbers of 1.96 and simply work with two standard deviations. And we're going to make the claim that from our estimates, from the mean values or the point estimates we find, we're 95% sure that the true value will lie at plus minus two standard deviations. Now, when we work with regressions, we don't have a normal standard distribution, nor do we have standard deviations. Instead, we have what we call the student's t distribution, and we estimate standard errors. However, the mechanics on how we compute intervals are going to be the same as those we just described for the normal standard distribution. And now let's go back to our result from a statistical package, in this case Gretel, to see the standard error. You can note that in addition to our coefficients, right beside them we have standard errors. And we want to focus on the standard error and the coefficient of income, which is the slope. 
Remember that in most cases, the intercept does not have an intuitive interpretation. Our coefficient can be rounded to 0 0.853, and we're going to add and subtract two times the standard error of 0 0.051, and we have a range that goes from 0 0.751 to 0 0.954. So again, we're simply taking the point estimate of the coefficient and adding and subtracting two times the standard error. With this, we have constructed the 95% confidence interval for the slopes coefficient, which is the range we just discussed. What we know now is that all these values within this range are consistent with our data set. Overall, if we kept on running the Excel example, we would find that 95% of the cases, the values we find lie within this 95% confidence interval. But we have not answered the question which with we started this video. Is there really a strong relationship between income and consumption? We're going to answer this question the other way around. We're going to start by thinking what should happen if there were no relationship. And let's remember for a moment our linear regression model, which was y equals beta 0, the intercept, plus beta 1 times x plus the error term. And if y never changed whenever x changed, that meant that x plays no role and that the coefficient of x would be a zero, meaning that in all cases y is just the intercept plus an error term. It doesn't matter what value x takes it, y will never change its value. If we took this idea to our consumption and income model, it would mean that the coefficient for income is a zero, and it doesn't matter what income a family has, consumption will always remain the same. So what we want to show now is that there is a relationship, meaning that the coefficient for income for the x variable, for the independent variable, is not a zero. If that coefficient is not a zero, then we will be able to make a claim that there is a statistically significant relationship. So. A very easy to remember rule of thumb here. We already learned how to construct the confidence intervals and we're going to say that if zero is outside of our 95% confidence interval, then there is a statistically significant relationship. This is very important for you to memorize. Formally, what we're doing here is that we're rejecting the hypothesis that there is no relationship or that zero is a possible value for the slope. We also call this the null hypothesis. We first hypothesize that there is no relationship and then reject it by showing that zero is not a possible value. We're 95% sure at least that zero is not a possible value for the coefficient. And if we reject this null hypothesis, which means that zero is not a possible value, it means that some other numbers must be within our 95% confidence interval and there may be a positive or a negative relationship, but we are sure that there is some relationship. In other words, we are accepting that there is a relationship by accepting this alternate hypothesis. So let's go back to our example. We had found a 95% confidence interval that went from 0 0.751 to 0 0.954. And it is very obvious that zero is not within this range. What does this mean? It means that we're pretty, pretty sure that zero is not in our possible values and hence that there is a relationship. In managerial terms, there is a statistically significant relationship between income and consumption. Now, let me give you another rule of thumb. This one's a little bit of a black box and it's associated with the p-values of the regression. And we're going to say that if a p-value is below 5%, which means 0.05, then we can claim their statistically significant relationship. And you will see that even though this interpretation is much less intuitive than the one about the confidence interval we just discussed, we're going to end up using it much more frequently. Now, what are p-values? Well, I'll show you in just a second. These are also standard outputs of statistical packages. Roughly speaking, these p-values are the probability that we reject the null hypothesis when it is actually true. In other words, the p-value is going to be a probability that there is no relationship. And let me show you how this looked 
in our example. On the rightmost column of our Gretel output, we had the p-values. And in this case, the p-value for the income coefficient is 3.24 e-19. e-19 is really scientific notation to say 3.24 times 10 powered to minus 19, which is the same as saying 3.24 divided by 10 to the 19. If you do the math, that is 0 0.0000018032432, which is certainly smaller than 0 0.05, smaller than 5%. So we're very sure that we're not going to reject the null hypothesis if it were true. In other words, we are very sure there is a statistically significant relationship. Now, note those three asterisks or stars right by the p-value. Those stars are something very commonly used in statistical output to represent ranges of the p-value. If we only see one star, that will generally mean that the p-value is below 10% which implies that there is no statistically significant relationship. If we find two stars, we also talk about a 5% level. This means that the p-value is below 0.05. And based on a rule of thumb, this means that there is a statistically significant relationship because we're 95% sure that zero is not within our confidence interval. And finally, if we have three stars, as we have in this case, that means that the p-value is below 1%. And remember that in this case, the p-value was insanely small. This means that there's a 1% probability that the coefficient is zero. In other words, we're very, very sure there's a statistically significant relationship. So let's summarize what we have learned. First, since we're working with samples, we must acknowledge and work with uncertainty in our estimates. We know that the numbers we are finding are not precise and that there is uncertainty around them. We also learned that we can construct a 95% confidence interval of our coefficients, which means ranges of values between which we're 95% certain that our true value is in it by adding and subtracting two standard errors from the point estimate of the coefficient. We also learned that if this confidence interval includes zero, then we say that there is no statistically significant relationship. But if zero is not in this range, if the range excludes zero, then there is a statistically significant relationship. Finally, we can also check the p-values. If the p-value is above 5%, we say there is no relationship. And conversely, if the value is below 5% or 0.05, we say that there is a significant relationship between the coefficient we're focusing on and the dependent variable. Thank you very much.